War gets boring. Yeah, it does. Like it's not like you're in a gunfight all day long, twenty four hours a day. There are days where you're like, I gotta sit on this pallet of MREs for a week. Okay. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. Let's do it. Are we live? Board's on. Great. That's awesome. So <laughs> that's what it means is the board is on. Okay. I understand now. I have so, encouraged Phil to get a a light, a red and a green yeah, light. Yeah. Like you'd imagine, um, I don't know, in the old days. Right. Like the old FM radio days. Mm-hmm. But he, yeah. he, it's just not. It's not in his he's, DNA. He's not going to do it. Priorities. No. What's, so what's, the, what's your elk hunting situation going on right now? Are you Have you been out? Nope. And well, here's I drew. I just got back from moose hunting. Okay. Um, and I drew what is arguably the most coveted tag in in my state in Montana. If For you moose. ask that question, you'd you'd get two answers maybe. Like, okay. what is the most coveted elk tag? Right. Um, and I drew one of them. So. Nor, much of the state, the bulk, I shouldn't say the bulk of the state. Yeah, I, I guess like the bulk of the elk hunting in the state is is over the counter for right. residents. You just mm-hmm. buy it at the gas station yeah. or online. But we have we have um, limited draw units. And years ago, they carved out this chunk of ground that, that sits on the northwest border of yellowstone national park oh right and it used to be a general unit it used to be like the elk unit right and and i haven't i I keep meaning to get into the history of it because i have a friend whose relative was instrumental in creating this thing called the buffer zone and it's a little over 50 square miles that sits up against the park right and they give out five elk tags every year for the buffer zone and you can't even hunt deer in it. Right. Okay. So just so no one's in there hunting deer. There's no cow tags. It's just five it might even be either sex. Either it's five elk tags right. for fifty square miles. And what it does is it gets elk as elk are migrating out of the park, mm-hmm. it gives them kind of well, a buffer. Yeah. Between as they're exiting the park and dispersing around, because they follow some some of those elk that live in Yellowstone follow some pretty predictable migratory routes mm-hmm. before they fan out and go in various paths. And so I think it's meant to kind of soften the migration exit out of there. There are resident elk there, but kind of the real gem is when they start moving out, right. of, that, out of the high country, like out of what what is Yellowstone National Park, and start moving out. I was going to go and hunt it archery and then yeah. hunt it for rifle. Right. But then I got a kind of a cool uh, deer hunt opportunity down in Idaho where I also drew a tag. It's not as cool, but worth going. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go do that. And then I'm going to dedicate the last couple weeks of our general firearm to really hanging out in the buffer zone. Oh, that's great. Mm-hmm. Gosh. Yeah. So that's, so is it, is it a point system up here then? They, this state does, when, when you, uh, I don't mean to tell you, at the risk of telling you something you already know, you have states that don't do anything. Yep. Alaska, mm-hmm. Idaho, New Mexico, like right. everybody's in the draw together. There's no building points. And then you have these states that do what they call preference points where the max point holders mm-hmm. are, are given a certain slot of the draw. So they might say like, okay, 70% of the tags will go to whoever has the most points. And so once you're a max point holder, you have a guarantee of drawing it. Montana does something that kind of gets a similar, winds up doing, I guess, the same function is they square all of your points. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I've never drawn a limited draw elk tag in this state. So I think my name was in the hat 400 and sometimes. Okay. Because you get squared. Yeah, yeah, you get squared. Meanwhile, my son, his name was in the hat one time. Right. So I had to jump on him. Yeah. Like you. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, but I don't know how many, um, I mean, there are dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people who have all the points. Yeah. But it, you know, helps out. So that's how they run it here for all the, for all the limited entry stuff. Yeah. So what's it, what's your, and I kind of know the answer because I, I think you and I talked about it before, but 
Is there a time of year and an animal that you prefer to hunt over anything else? Mm -hmm. Is it like, this is the time of year that fires me up. This is the animal that fires me up. This is the region of the world, regardless. Like, just answer all those questions. If I had to limit it down and just like pick very specific things, I would yeah. want to hunt turkeys in the spring. Okay. And I'd want to hunt mule deer in the fall. Okay. So you're a mule deer guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, do you see that? Because I see it as like they're mule deer guys and they're elk guys, mm -hmm. right? It's like very distinctly different camps. And they both kind of scoff at each other like, oh. Like, mm, have you yeah, seen I don't, that? I don't, I don't, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. It's like I'm an elk guy or I'm yeah, a mealy guy. Little rivalries. Yeah, a little rivalry. I'm too much of a generalist for all that. Yeah. You know, your, your, your cousin, mm -hmm. he works with Jason Phelps. Yeah. We always laugh at Jay, you know, Jason Phelps, all he thinks about, I mean, he likes to hunt mule deer and elk, yeah. but he's got a thing where he had, like, the rivalries, he had vowed to never kill a white tail deer. <laughs> Vowed to not kill a white tail deer. That's awesome. We took him down. Like he went coos deer hunting with us, yeah. which is a desert white tail, and he yeah. was able to draw out that that's not the same thing. Right. So he didn't break his vow. <laughs> <laughs> which to me is like, I don't do that. I mean, I like everything, right? But yeah. But no, I, I particularly like that. Okay. Especially if you can do it in late November. Right. But there's something about when, when, when mule deer are rutting and you're going to see deer you don't, you're going to see deer you don't normally see and then the thing I also really like about it is if you find some does and you're just watching them, like, you know. Right. Right. Like, you see, so you see not just one doe doesn't, like, a doe and a fawn, you're kind of like, ah, eh, whatever. Not whatever, but you don't really know. But I mean, you find a pocket of five or six does you during know. the mule deer rut. And there's right. not many places you can hunt that late. It's, you know, there's not a lot of states you can do that, but to really hunt in the peak of the rut. But as close as you can get to it, and you find five or six does, and just the feeling of anticipation of knowing that if you watch them for a day or two, bucks are just going to keep turning up on them right. and keep turning up on them and keep turning up on them. It's so much fun, man. I love it. I love it. I So I haven't done a lot of deer hunting outside of like Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and well, and then our, our hunt, which we'll talk about a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but I fell into that camp of, well, I like hunting elk. This is what I like to do. It's fun. It's loud. It's kind of obnoxious. It's not a hard sell. It's like they're huge. They're huge. They make all kinds of noise. Yeah. Like I was saying, it was like, I, I want to do this uh, design. I was like, it's a forest horse with swords on its head. It's yeah, fucking sure. cool. Yeah. It's a really cool animal to get close to. And you have these really interesting experiences with these, you know, close experiences with these really big, powerful animals. It's it's amazing. Yeah. It's an amazing. They can come experience. in in a way that's menacing. Yeah, they can come in a way that unnerves you. Yeah, like no one gets unnerved by a mule deer. No, no. If he'd anything, have have he'd have to have something real wrong with him to be unner <laughs> <laughs> to be unnerving. <laughs> like, like what, this thing's not intimidating. No, he's, but this thing, horse like, comes that trotting thing, in. Yeah, like, that thing's paranoid, is what he is. But an elk, yeah, yeah. It's it's and it's like snots flowing out. <laughs> and it's loud. It's clunking. You know, or glunking. What do they call that? Yeah. Yeah, what what does that noise come from? Do you know what that noise comes from? Is it coming from its stomach? I think he's stomach? doing the same, yeah. Yeah, that'd be a good question for Yanni because you even see him do like a pelvic thrust. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was... Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I know that Yanni has explained it to me and we've talked about how they're somehow getting their junk into it. That's what that's what I've heard too, where yeah. they're banging their, their junk against their belly. Yeah. But... I can't do that. I, you know, I, I mean, not without a significant amount of help... I'd, yeah, I'd have, you to know, help. I'd have to have Yanni help me. Yeah, there'd mm -hmm. have to be some some help involved, like any <laughs> like some type of podcast producer or something would have to plug in. No, we're we're just hunting moose, and they have a similar, but not. They got a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where were but you? But they at? don't. But it's effortless. They don't. They don't. They're like. Yeah. Where were you? At? They're like Packers, not. They're not all they're, over the place. Yeah, they're and, they're they're. You know, giant. He's not air he's humping. Not he's banging not air a humping drum, something. You know, yeah, that's exactly. what it sounds like. It's like it sounds like that thing's like banging their hollow stomach or something. It's, great it's like noise. sloshing around. It's a great Wild. word. It's a great word. Glunk. Yeah, it is. It's and I don't think it exists in other vocabularies. I no. think it'd be interesting for us to look at see if it's in the in the Japanese dictionary. Yeah, I don't Phil, think, Phil I don't when was the last time that. you said the word glunk? Oh, at least twenty years. Yeah. <laughs> so you, it's just, it's just people don't use that word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, glunking. Yeah, yeah. I think you know. I think we could make that a a new T shirt design. I'd be glunking something like that. I think that's a cool. It's a cool T shirt design for me to 
Yeah. Later on. What? So where were you moose hunting? We were moose hunting in so south of the Yukon River, not far from where the Yukon River flows out of Yukon Territory. Okay. Mm-hmm. Were you productive, successful? Yeah. 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 It was the the area we were in has a there's a ten day season and we were there mm-hmm. for the whole season. Okay, and then finally at six thirty p.m. on the last day of the season, called a couple bulls in. Wow, and they're they, menacing. They are. They're they're when they terrifying. when they finally get where they're going to come in, they're yeah. menacing. Yeah, yeah. I will say not as loud though. It's not like that insane. The lot, the, you know, yeah. like a, like a, like they, they got their little noise, which is fine, but it's not like, yeah, you know. I've had that feeling, uh, when I was younger, I was working in Botswana and I was out with the Botswana defense force. And it was the first time they were introducing us to, to lions because we were going out into the field and we're doing, um, we we're doing these counter poaching things. So they're oh. showing us, Hey, this is a lion. You know, this is a female. This is a male. This like, is a zebra. Yeah, this is a zebra. <laughs> you know, so you're kind of like, this is cool. You know, like, I'm going to be in on this. But the the male lion, when it when it roared, it shook the plural space in your lungs. So you, like, it's oh. power from its sound. You could feel it, and it was terrifying. It was it's the only sound outside of gunfire from another animal that had... Mm-hmm physically made an impact and then also terrified me at the same time even though it was in in you know behind a cage it mm, was terrifying it spoke to you oh my gosh yeah. and um but elk do the same thing if you're close to them and their bugle you know they're they're ripping they can shake that space in your lungs and you can feel it it doesn't terrify you like a lion but it's still nonetheless you can feel how powerful the animal is you can feel it cuz yeah. so so incredibly loud and when they're really ripping and you're so close and you know like okay well i'm either going to take that or you're just close watching which i've done it multiple times it's it's an incredible experience because you can feel the animal so it's a different type of connection i've often uh, thought that that at, when they're in the rut and really going nuts i you'd look at them and almost think that they're um they like live off rabbits and stuff yeah yeah. It's like, how? There's no way that thing eats grass. <laughs> no way. There's no way it eats grass. <laughs> no way. It probably eats deer fawns. Yeah. It's something. It's just, it, yeah. It eats gets... baby bears. <laughs> <laughs> Skewers them. But a mule deer, he, he's, he looks very herbivorous. <laughs> <laughs> but I they're, I they're, I don't mean to dog on them. Their whole groove is cool as shit. But yeah, they're, uh, they're a shy, sensitive, they're a shy, sensitive animal. So. If you were to classify them into humans and then break them down into stereotypical regions, would you say like elk is like a New Jersey male and then a mule deer would be like a California vegan? No, it'd be elk could be like, um, I don't like a weightlifter. I don't have, I'm not, I don't have good newer references. All mine are real old. Yeah, that's good. Well, if I was going to say Hulk Hogan, what would I say nowadays? Hulk Hogan. I think okay. it still lives. I yeah, think, it, think oh, a, a riding elk is a Hulk Hogan yeah, yeah. figure. Yeah. And uh, mule deer is like a Brando. Martin right. Brando. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you're like contradicting the personalities in that way. Mm-hmm. I like that. Mm-hmm. Like a Hulk Hogan. Okay. I can see that. Is he still alive? I would imagine. I mean, I think. Oh, yeah, because he got in a big dust up with. Uh, he got in a big dust up with. Maybe I'll think of someone else. Bought some photos. I don't know. Oh yeah, he had like, um, yeah. I I don't Doesn't exactly matter. remember. But... I don't want to get my facts wrong. What the hell is on your shirt? Oh, it's an espresso machine. That's a that's a Lamarzoco Linea Three, which is like an <laughs> OG espresso <laughs> machine. Thinking, is that some kind of souped up coffin? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Everybody thinks it's so funny because people always look at it and they're like. Exactly that. Like, what the hell is on your on your shirt? That's a real insider shirt. No, it's super inside baseball. Like, okay, if you yeah. if you know what this is, you're a coffee nerd, like yeah, a full like blown. It. Like, you've caught the bug. You're you're a full blown nerd. Yeah. Okay. I like what's on your shirt. Do you like those? Do you like those broadheads? Yeah, I like that guy too. Yeah, I like that guy a lot. Yeah. I just got turned on to this dude um, from DCA that he makes custom arrows. Oh, yeah. You seen his? No. Oh man! So him and Carl—is that right? 
or it's Kyle and uh, Bill from Iron Will. Yep. Yeah. They teamed up and they do these custom arrows. Oh, I do know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. They're, no, Yanni just ordered some of those. Did he? Yeah. Yeah. So I've I've got everybody going over to get some of those because he's, I, I was shooting his arrow against my arrow. Like when I say his arrow, one of the guys I was hunting with, um, exact green weight draw length as my arrow, but I've made mine. So I fletched it and cut it. But so green weight, everything was the same. Mm hmm. I was like two two grams off, which whatever, it doesn't really matter. But he was getting 10 inches of additional flight out of the same weight because of the way that he's he's designing them at 50. So I was Excuse getting- Excuse me, because I don't understand when you say 10 inches of he, additional so at 50, So at 50 yards, I was shooting my arrows and I had one group. And then I just plugged his arrow in, which is oh. like one, two grams off. Elevation. Yeah, and I'm yeah. getting 10 additional arrows based on- the aerodynamics of the way he's building it. Yeah. So I called him as this John um, Casmus was a guy that I was hunting with. And um, he was like, yeah, call this guy. He's, he's making custom arrows. They're great. You should order some. So I ordered some instantly. I was like on my phone, hiking up the mountain, texting him like, hey mm -hmm. man, how, how do I get some, some arrows? But uh, yeah, Yanni will have to say like, if they're good. Yeah, Yanni's into it. Yanni's into the, He's into the the tinkering. My for when it comes to archery setups, I'm in the habit of. No, I'm not going to change this. I'm right. in the habit of just talking to people that know a lot more than I know, mm -hmm. and and just having faith in what they tell me, because there's a lot there's a lot of things I like, but I just haven't um, I haven't gotten to where I I I, I just rely on what people tell me to do with what? archery equipment, not with firearms, but with archery yeah. equipment. I'm just like, you, you, here's here's my body. Right. Like, you tell me. This is what I look like. <laughs> the thing the thing I, I like about you is you're not you're not a a gear you're not like you're not geeking out and going down the rabbit hole on a bunch of No, I'd like to. Yeah, but you don't do it. You know, no. and when I say that I'm, it's a compliment because there's some dudes you're like, Okay, man, I, I I got it, but I can't spend two and a half hours talking about the stabilizer. Like yeah, it's not, yeah. it's just not my thing. Part of the problem I think is I do too much, not too much. I'm I'm a very I'm a generalist. Yeah. So every week out of every like every week out of every month out of every year, there's always something I'm going to do, and um, I sort of fantasize about just narrowing in, mm -hmm. you know, like narrowing in and just getting like in like obsessed with some particular thing and just having that be the thing. Right. But I'm, I'm just always on to the next thing. And so I can afford to do it and still stay up on shit because just professionally I'm surrounded with a lot of people that know what's mm -hmm. going on. So I probably know more than I think I know about archery equipment, for instance. Right. Like one of the guys I work with, Garrett Long, like all I just like for firearm issues, he's a competitive shooter and right. he shoots more than anybody far and away more than anybody I know. I was just ask him like, "Okay, hey, listen, what's up with this now?" And he'll I'll get I'll know just enough to know, but then I don't have any doubt that I'm getting good field tested information. Right. So when it comes to, you know, like everybody, I was shooting um what are those uh what the hell is the arrow everybody shot for the longest time and then now people are quitting using them. It's like aluminum, is it carbon? No, is it, like, it was the, the <sighs> Is it the arrow or is it no, the it's like an arrow? Full metal jack. Yeah, yeah, the FMJs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, shoot, I still shoot them. Well, I'm not dogging on them. I'm just yeah. saying. Every, for a while, everybody but, shot. Everybody yeah. shot FMJs, yeah, yeah. so I shot FMJs, and right. then all of a sudden, everybody's like, "Well, in fact," and so I'm like, "Oh, well, get me some of those too." Right. And I switched to those because it's people I know that that are that geek out. So I just take their geek out info. Yeah. And and I can't. And if someone said like, "Oh, I noticed you switch from blank to blank," I wouldn't be like, "Oh yeah, well, I ran all the numbers and." I'd be more like, well, that's what Yanni and Phelps were saying. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they told me. <laughs> that's what they told me. They just told me to do it. Yeah, and I can't. I don't know. I'm not going to argue those guys. No, about it. I do the same thing. They, I read, call, all, they read all that shit. <laughs> I call people, like I'll call people and just ask them because uh -huh. I, I don't know. Like the other thing is I, I don't I don't have the time like you. I just don't have the time to to jump full in on the deep end on some of this stuff and think about like what's the weight ratio on the collar that I need to put on my arrow and then yeah. how am I like I just 
Sure. Like, is it interesting? And if I had an inordinate amount of time that I could just, you know, load up on my calendar and blast away, I probably would because I'm that big of a nerd on certain things, but I just don't have the availability to do it. And I just call people like, Hey, what's going on? I had, I had the same kind of conversation where I was asking around about, I was having, having some issues with my bow and I had a too aggressive, I, I, I went to a too aggressive cam, so I didn't really have, um, the, the release point to where it goes into, you know, relax or whatever it is. I forget what it's called, the wall. Um, I didn't have a lot back there. It was like 85% let off, but then. Oh, and it was like, and it was like, if, if yeah, I, I don't if like I, that feeling. like, dude, I, I could I don't not, need someone, I don't need someone to tell me I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like it, but everybody was like, this is what you need to go to, you know? No, and I, and I, and I was like, I hate this. And I struggled with it for months. And I'm like, what's wrong with me? I hate this. I hate this. You know? And it's like, it must be me. Everybody else likes it because it's aggressive. And you get like another one foot You're per like, second. Back, back, back you know? and, what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no. And I hated it. I like to be eased. I like a yeah. little bit of easing in yeah. on the back end. Yeah, same. So I, I was like, I got to get out of this. So I yep. finally, actually, Joe, I called Joe. And because he's a fairly objective guy, I was like, what's what's the deal? And he's like, Oh, you got to do this, this, and this. It's the same thing with like, cause I can call him and he'll tell me what he thinks and he won't give me any bullshit. Cause yep. he, it's not as if like Hoyt or, you know, Easton or any of those guys, it's not like he's sponsored by him. So he's not going to give you, he's like, going to give his, you good info. Yeah. He's going to give you the, yeah. the, the stuff, the good stuff. I, I know enough, um, experts in various fields now that a lot of times when someone asks, when people ask me a question, I'll refer them elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. I wind up being like a um, a concierge. Mm -hmm. So recently someone asked me a bear baiting question. And I'm right. like, you know what? I'm going to put you in touch with like the guy <laughs> that knows more about bear baiting than anyone on the planet. Or be like, hey, why do turkeys go like this? Right. I'd be like, you should talk to the wild turkey doc. I'll connect you on text. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, a, I'm like a, like a, I'm a conduit. You're a, you're a concierge. I'm a conduit for ex, Steve um, Ranella. Ex, yeah, expertise conduit. Yeah, expertise concierge. It should be my service should be called. I don't know, but I'll tell you who does. <laughs> is my service. Well, it's the same thing because I, I a few months ago I texted you when I came into town. I was like, where do I drink coffee in Bozeman? You gave me the three places that I should be drinking coffee in Bozeman, and I've been there literally every time I come into town and that's where I drink coffee. No, that's correct. Yeah, you're 100% right. Oh, yeah. You're 100% right. So I thank you for that. Uh, Treehouse, like that place is great. Mm -hmm. Like they've got great coffee. I mean, the vibe right, in there. They're downtown. Yeah, yeah, it's right yeah. downtown. I love that. Place. You almost feel like you should, you got to like apologize for coming in. I know. Yeah, yeah but we're- Sorry, man. I just needed a coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to disturb you in your artisan and crafts. I just was trying to get caffeinated, and I understand that I don't belong here, but I need to get coffee. <laughs> um, couple things. How many books have you written now? Um, seriously? Well, because it just gets a little bit complicated. Why? How does it get complicated? Nine or ten. Okay. This is just getting so far up there. Well, no, because we're uh, like, cause working on multiple ones at a time and then oh, some okay. art and audio projects. Gotcha. Yep, right. audio projects. So I did I did three. My first three books were narrative nonfiction books, mm -hmm. right? Like books that tell a story. Right. And I'll get back, I'll, and I'll, I'll get, I, I look forward to the day in my career when I get back into narrative nonfiction. But then I did, you know, like a two-part guidebook series. Yeah. So. The Complete Guide to Hunting, Butchery, and Cooking Wild Game. When we got done with that. Which I it, really like. It was it's 700 pages long. Yeah. It was right here, actually. I was, just saw it on the way in. Oh, did you? Yeah. Not the cookbook, but the we had this like two, like small, mm -hmm. volume one, small game. Volume one, yep. So that was 700 pages. And my publisher was just, you can't, I mean, no one's, you can't, you can't have a 700 page book. Mm -hmm. like it doesn't even, it, it's just not a thing. Right. And so she's like, you either um, cut a bunch of it out and figure it out, or we do two. So we just made it volume one, volume two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so that was kind of intended to be one, but it became two. So did you get to cheat and count it as two? That's great. Yeah. I think you can count it as two. Uh, so so yeah. there's two. Because <laughs> it's 
and clearly did, labeled too. Then one yeah, two. did a cookbook, um, the Wild Game cookbook. Did an outdoor skills uh, book. Right now we're working on a. Did a book about raising kids. Yeah, I love that book. Outdoor kids in an inside Good. world. I'm not like an expert kid raiser, but I'm I have a lot of expertise about engaging kids with nature. You have kids, yeah, and what all, and have right. been at it for a long time. Like very aggressive about, uh, very aggressive about giving them outdoor experiences. So I developed subject matter expertise mm-hmm. on just how much of a pain in the ass it is to get your kids outside. Yeah, and how to overcome that pain in the assness. Uh, and then right now we're working on a kids like a like a kind of an activity book for kids, mm-hmm. which will be cool. Doing an outdoor cooking book. Like what? Like uh, are you talking about like Dutch grilling, ovens and grilling stuff like smoke? That or, What's that? Grilling, smoking, not like Dutch ovens or no? Or, yeah, there'll yeah, be yeah. Dutch oven stuff okay. in there, but yeah. all kinds of outdoor cooking. Right. We're not going to use this because it's almost too tidy. From the back country to the backyard, too tidy. Why wouldn't you use it? Because everybody thinks it's too tidy. I thought it was great. Yeah, why? Well, I, I mean, I no one wants to put keep it, on it the... simple. Stupid. It's a kiss principle. Right? Well, I know. Listen, right. I, like the the um. I'm working with someone I've worked with a whole bunch uh, named Krista Ruane. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and Krista, we did the first cookbook together, and she's my kind of partner and buddy on this whole project. Um, and she thinks it's too tidy. And then I work with someone very closely with an editor named Savannah on our end. Mm-hmm. And she, I feel like she thinks it's too tidy huh. from the back country to the backyard. What do you Maybe. Think about that? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see it. What's your? I'm, I'm kind of on Savannah's side on yeah. this. One. Really? Yeah, yeah it's tired. it's one of those things that you see in a in a bookstore and you're like, yeah, it's a little too winky. It's, you know, it's, from the back country. It's too trite. Kinda. Yeah. From the backyard to the back country. I mean, I don't think it's going to repel people from buying the book, but it's you know. Well, either way, I want people out there to That's know that whether I use it or not, that shit's mine, man. Yeah. Is that how your, copyright works? I think so. Okay. I think I. I mean, I don't know. I. I, I could What's establish myself as two, a. It's two, it's two, the summer 2022, late summer. Yeah. I'm saying that back country to backyard is my shit. Yeah. It's legally it's great. binding now. Yeah. yeah. It's legally binding, and I think that the show will hold up in the court of law. I think. It's yeah. What's your? My my question is, what do you have a favorite piece that you've written? Because you started initially it was mainly for magazines that's where you started your, your mm-hmm. writing right for publication and then you the best in. thing i wrote yeah what do you think do you have something like yeah it doesn't even look like the I was best. At, i'll tell you what i was thing? at the height of my powers <laughs> the height of your power yeah. i was at the height of my powers yeah when i wrote um my buffalo book Amer- really? american buffalo in search of a lost icon i'll explain why yeah i was as mature as i was gonna get without having kids oh okay gotcha so i was just more focused and disciplined um than i was when i wrote my first book i was in a relationship with who became my wife so i could sense the need to buckle down right and be focused and disciplined but i wasn't exhausted and distracted from having kids right and it worked out that i was able to really spend a lot of time on it so i because i i could i put a pause on when i came out of graduate school i just did magazine work Mm -hmm. then i did a book and i did a book and magazine work Mm -hmm. i had gotten good money for my first book at the time it was no i don't i don't want to change it around i I got what the time felt to me like a staggering sum of money for my first book I got like a six figure advance for my first book. Right. And I didn't do the math to figure out what that meant because you get a third up front. Right. You get a third when you submit the manuscript. You get a third when it comes out. So all this money you have, once you spread it out over the years, you don't have that much money. Right. And then it's, it's expensive to work on them because you got to yeah. do all the research and travel. Right. But it seemed like a lot of money. Cause you so you s- have to pay for all that? Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. There's all, I mean, now th- there's. That was my deal then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It was like right. it was here's the money and you're going to spend what you're going to spend on mm-hmm. it, right? And I and I spent a lot uh you know, the research component. So anyways, I had done that. I got a I was working up and got a good deal. I got like a good advance for my book. It enabled me to not even really do any magazine. I didn't do any serious magazine work. Mm-hmm. I did research for 18 months. 
I got to a point where I knew because I just didn't do anything but focus on this one thing besides hunting and messing around, but work professionally, work wise, my work brain, I just worked on that. And I got where I knew more about the subject than anybody alive. Now, I didn't know more about all the parts. Like someone knew way more than me about physiology. Someone knew way more than me about um, Native American use, right? Someone knew vastly more than me about like Native American relationships to someone knew more to me than me about whatever, the recovery efforts. But taken all together from pop culture to physiology to history, whatever, I knew more than anybody. And then I got to that point and and then sp- spent a whole year putting all my research down and, and all my experiences down into book form. And, I've, and that was the last time I ever have really been able to focus on anything. Do you miss that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But my wife points out, she's like, you were the most miserable Seriously? doing that. Why? Like, why, why, why were you miserable? Cause I just, you know, no one knows what they really, no one knows what they really like. I should say no one. Like, because of the obsession or what, what is it? Uh, yeah. I mean, I would work, I don't, you know, six days I would write eight, read and write eight to 10 hours a day. Right. Six days a week. Yeah. Unless I was, especially in the summer months, whatever, you know, unless, except when I was doing for fun, mm-hmm. um, I was just very, very dedicated and focused on doing it. And I, yeah, I probably was miserable doing it. Um, but I, I really miss that level of focus. And it was shortly after that that I got into, um, it was shortly after that that I got into still doing books, but doing doing television. Um, and then much later doing that and, and trying to um, establish a business. You know what I mean? It, it, it's just like, focus got hard yeah focus got hard but i was a one man i was a one man deal i work with all like we're so productive now because i work with a a, a, i work with a bunch of people so we're able to do all kinds of stuff right but i'm but i'm always only 25 percent thinking about anything and it and it's great and that's a very impactful i'm sure you understand it very well Mm -hmm. uh but i missed that level of focus and someday I will return to that when I'm when I'm old. Right. I'll return to that. But I don't know if how if my brain will work as good as it did back then. Um I've quit drinking since then. So I I might even do better. Altogether. You don't drink at all anymore. Yeah. Well I kind of I'm I'm landing there. Mm -hmm. I'm landing there. Same with me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I haven't been drunk in I haven't been drunk in four years. Yeah. I haven't had I haven't had an identifiable buzz in, in four years. And the last time I did, I, I think I was hung over for two days. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's miserable. It's a miserable experience now. Yeah. Like, I drink four or five vodka tonics in Las Vegas. Yeah. How old are you? For days. 48. Yeah. So I'm 45. So we're basically the same age. I think mm-hmm. you got, I was just having, I was just having this conversation with another guy. Like we we're, you know, same age, give or take. And we're like, this sucks. It's really, it's just really miserable. It's a miserable experience. Like even, one glass of wine if I over pour on a glass of wine like I feel like shit yeah. I feel like shit trying to even go to sleep because like for whatever reason I don't know if it's the sugar or who knows but I feel like shit yeah regardless not to talk about alcohol I'm interested in in two things now because you're talking about this is the last time you focused and then you you branched off into a bunch of different forms of media and then business so when <laughs> like see you're being drawn in court Unfoc- yeah. I'm unfocused <laughs> But if you have your television show, you have your the the writing that you're doing and a podcast and a business and all these different things you're doing. But what is the thing that you get up in the morning you're like this is my this is my thing. I, I like this thing. Is it shooting the show? Is it doing the podcast? Is it writing? Is it what what is your thing? Is it too, all of it? No, yeah, it's too complicated to answer. I uh I thought I came up with this quote, but someone told me I didn't come up with it. And it's to the effect of uh, it's to the effect of I hate writing, but I like having written. <laughs> Apparently, someone said it better than that. Really? But it's a, it's anyone that most of the writers I know know that what I'm like they know what I'm talking about. Mm. It's just that it's just there's a it's like um 
is it, it's it's a slog, you know. I, I heard another quote. I definitely didn't. I can't take any credit for this quote. Um, some writer described writing as driving at night with your headlights on. Mm-hmm. You can see like just that far, right? But you just go and go and go and go and go and eventually you get somewhere. But you just can only see like what's immediately in front of you, right? And and it's just it just is hard. And so, but then you get it done, and it just there's nothing better. There's nothing better. But I'm but I I was but you gotta keep in mind like I was born in 1974, so I I am very pre-internet. Yeah, and so a book was a th- like to be an author and write a book was a thing that I still reg- I still put a ton of cultural value mm-hmm. on it that that my kids probably aren't gonna um my kids are probably not gonna look at a book as a physical manifestation of something as in and of itself of value probably right i'm be like a typewriter or something yeah it'd be it, so it just meant a lot like mm-hmm. having a book and i was and i was trained as a writer you know i went to graduate school to write um i, I sold my first article like right before the dot-com crash but there was just like like books were a thing yeah and i value them so i don't like doing them but i love having it done and, and i've said before if, if someone's going to chisel something into my tombstone i'd way rather they chiseled author than tv host yeah right yeah uh in terms of things that i actually in, like what do i enjoy doing in the moment the most work yeah work related the, tri- the trivia show really huh oh it's the highlight of is that what you're trying to segue to right now is that mo- what we're doing no i'm just saying most of the people that come in <laughs> Most people that come and do the trivia show yeah. will tell you that it's probably one of their favorite things. Their favorite work related activity is doing mm-hmm. the trivia show. I like filming. I, I lo- like I like filming our show a lot. Yeah. But if you had a thing that could measure pleasure in your brain. There is a thing that can measure pleasure. Oh, I'd like to have yeah. someone hook that up to me while I play the trivia <laughs> show. If I'm playing and winning, yeah, you're high pleasure. High pleasure. High pleasure. Way higher than writing anything. Anything right. I got to write, I'm always like, do I yeah. seriously got to write this? That's how I always feel. So there's there's a combination of things going on here, which is you lived in Seattle for a while. Oh yeah, yeah. So my wife worked for Amazon. Yeah. So mm. there there was there used to be this bookstore that I loved, loved. It was like my favorite bookstore in Seattle. And well, let me see if you can guess it. Let's give oh, you some hints. The, uh, I know every town's got a super famous bookstore. Tattered Cover's not there. It's mm. the Elliot, what's it called? Elliot Bay Bookstore. Elliot Bay? Yeah. <laughs> right off the bat. Look at that. Were we playing trivia right trivia now? right there. <laughs> Elliot Bay. Yeah, that was, that. Did, did you ever go in there before they just, just. I did they, book events in there. Dude, it was such a great bookstore. Yeah. It was like. Are they not there anymore? No, they just, they, they, uh, they scraped it and they put in like, I think there's. They're they're selling like Kardashian makeup or some shit. In there what? Now. Yeah, it's 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 a travesty. They, they'll say like, they like, still they've got a second location I think around Capitol Hill that's still pretty. It's a massive warehouse. It's a it's a, it's a cool spot, but it's not it's, nearly. It's as not. Cool it's like Powell's and or yeah. Powell's in Oregon. Elliott Bay, Bay. Tattered, is Denver tattered cover. So sort of like like yeah. all the cities with the super famous old bookstore man. Yeah, Elliott Bay bookstore was was what I wanted every bookstore to be in. Mm-hmm. Or what I wanted every like the perfect bookstore that you could imagine. Elliott Bay was the perfect bookstore yeah. from from my perspective. Reverential Cause, to books because you could you know, go in there on a rainy, obviously like two hundred and seventy days out of the year it's rainy in Seattle, but you could go in there on a rainy day and they had a coffee shop in the 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 basement, and then they that coffee smell would permeate through the three levels of the three floors, <laughs> and then you had those creaky old wooden floors and they're big beams with cracks in them and as you're walking through it you creak as you're looking at all the books right and they had it the, like the sections were organized as, as three levels this fantastic bookstore where you could spend all day in there because you could go down get a cup of coffee you know go up take a look at all of what you wanted and then come back down and chuck polynack was the oh was an author that i discovered there in 1997 oh yeah, that's, that's how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to discover way. authors in your bookstore. Yeah, that's that. So when I well, the first book I got of his was there, and it was 
incredible because I was like, God, that's he's he's an incredible author. And because uh, I hadn't read anything like that, like I was reading like old old stuff, um, which leads me into your look, favorite look, bookstore. So there's but two part. I, but I, yeah, I want to I want to hit this bookstore thing for a minute because it'll help you understand being a writer and, and being other stuff, other forms of media. Yeah. When I was a writer, I might go to say an Elliott Bay. Yeah. And I would do a book event, and there might be a dozen people there. Yeah. Enough to where you, you, you would dread it. Yeah. You dread it. Um. Now, and that's like free. Right. Okay. Now we can go and sell out theaters. Mm hmm. And that ain't because of writing. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> there are writers that can do it, but there aren't many. No. There aren't uh. many. No, there aren't many. I can't even imagine. I I can't name an author off the top of my head that can do that unless they have companion based forms of media. You could get a p. You could get out a legal pad and get a page of. I might be exaggerating. I think you yeah. could get a legal pad and on a page, you could and not making like painstakingly small script. I think you could list out the writers that make a living from writing. Yeah, who today modern like guys that are living that are still writing who do you respect the most who do you read the most he hasn't come out with anything lately i don't think but but i think that uh of the of of like modern writers who i think are just in, like very important figures mm -hmm. i usually go to uh Cormac mccarthy yeah Right. I think is I think more like in terms of morality and a worldview. So yeah, you know, I mean, I guess that's what it takes to be a great writer is you have you you create a morality and you create a worldview mm. and you create like a, a package for understanding humanity and all that. I think that Cormac McCarthy, um, you know, he's still alive. Yeah. Uh, he might not be as prolific as he once was, but um, he's always been a slow burn. You know, he puts a lot of focus in it. But I think that his stuff is, I think his stuff is the most important stuff. And man, I don't, I don't, I, What's I, your I don't but I, I don't mean to sound, it's like, I don't want this to sound disrespectful to other writers. No. There's so many great writers. But I, I just look at if I could have a author, mm -hmm. you know, if I could be that when my kids, um, if when my kids turn 25, if I could have them really read and understand something, I would have them read and understand Cormac McCarthy. Oh, yeah, that's good. That's a good way to, to frame that. Yeah. Which is what, what are the books that would be on your shelf that you'd want your kids to pull off? I'd be like, I want you to read this, but understand it. Yeah. As a nonfiction writer, I would want them to read and understand the works of John McPhee. Yeah. And maybe Joan, a writer named Joan Didion. Who has a who? Um, she shares with Cormac McCarthy a rather dim worldview, but not without hope, but a um, a dim worldview. Like tr train you to not have super high expectations, right? Of so, do you have of everybody around you? <laughs> do you have a Cormac McCarthy book that sticks out as something that? This is the one that I would have them read and understand. Yeah, probably the 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 border trilogy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. In particular, I guess the crossing. The crossing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that they would because I don't fully understand it, but uh, Blood Meridian. They could Blood take Meridian. a stab at Blood Meridian. Yeah. The road. Mm -hmm. You know. You know. He did that, and it was so famous and great, but. Did you leave those though? Like, it, here's the thing that I have with this is I get really immersed in the story and it affects me emotionally because it's so draining. Mm -hmm. Like I'm in it yeah. and I can think about it and I find myself kind of like dragging my feet through the day at times where I'm like, oh, like, cause I'm in it. I'm in the story and I feel like that and it, it affects me. Sure. It does. It affects me. Do you, does that happen to you or do you just like, uh, whatever? Yeah. I just read, I, I just read, I just had that experience because when we were just moose hunting, we're moose hunting in a place and in a way where you just don't move for a long, long, long time. Right. So we sat in one spot for 10 days. Yeah. 
um, you, you just land on these kind of like ridge tops and, and you just got to stay in your little spot and calm and try to gradually bring something to you. So I read this whole book. It's not out yet, but um, there's a historian named Dan Flores and he wrote a, he, he has a book coming out in October. It's called Wild New World. And it's a history of humans and wildlife in America. Starting with, well, he kind of starts with the Chicxulub strike that, that killed the dinosaurs. Mm. But he gets real, it, it really kind of <laughs> begins with Clovis. Yeah. The arrival of Clovis mm-hmm. and ends now. And he has such, the book has such a dim view I just use dim worldview, so I shouldn't use the word dim again. It, um, it may the book really uh, highlights just the atrocities committed on wildlife by humans, mm-hmm. in particular the celebrated hunters of our past, like like who? the Boone, Daniel Boone. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm the Jim Bridgers, the Davy Crockett's. Mm-hmm. Um, and, <laughs> and I tried to resist it at first. You resisted the book? Or? I resisted sort of, there, there's a question with these, with these, with the, 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 our, 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 you know, our frontiersmen heroes. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's a question of to what degree did they know what they were doing? Right. You know, to what degree did they understand what was happening around them. Right. And to what degree were they the the victims of circumstance or, you know, did they have like a lived experience, right? So the really big, all the Buffalo hide hunters, for mm-hmm. instance, I mean, so many of those guys were coming out of the Civil, the civil War. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right? Just people, they were people, they fought for the Confederacy, mm-hmm. Confederacy, they fought for the Union, they were displaced, penniless, mm-hmm. war-ravaged, you know, had horrific stuff happen to them, whatever. And they went out and they're like, Hey, you can make some money shooting Buffalo on the great plains. Right. And they proceeded to just make like, money, almost kill all of them. Right. Uh, and then you look, you'd be like, well, you know, think about it, man, what they the cards they were dealt, you know, mm-hmm. and you have some level of pity on them to the point where you can still kind of celebrate the skill set. But reading this book of just thing after thing after thing. And it's, it's it's um the 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 woolly mammoths and then you're on to it's the predators it's the strychnine poisoning campaign of mm. predators it's the just ambivalence of the ivory billed woodpecker it's uh the, the 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 total ambivalence of what happened to the passenger pigeon right the near destruction of all the waterfowl species by market hunters mm. and then I'd always I was raised yeah, I was raised and began to just, these were celebrated figures. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, they did something kind of naughty, like they sure. killed everything. Yeah. But, I mean, holy cow, the skill sets, the adventure. Yeah, yeah. And um, and, <clears throat> and reading that book, I kept getting mad at the book. I got mad at the book. Now, I'm actually doing an event with the author here in town, right. and I'm, and I'm going to explain to him before we do the event that I was like, half of me feels like I should be protesting out front. Right. Not sitting here interviewing you. <laughs> I should be protesting your book because it's a it's a um, it's a dream ruiner. <laughs> it's a dream. It's a hero yeah, ruiner. Yeah, yeah. So I do feel that uh, in other ways, like with fiction, the road makes you want to hug your babies tight. Oh man, it, it really does. Right, it, it yeah. puts you into a puts me into a funk. You ready that, to kill for your babies? Yeah, you do. You 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 spend more time. You, become more emotionally aware and you also think about just what would you know because you you, in that specific book i constantly thought about what this must be like to be able to you know defend your children Mm -hmm. in those circumstances to the point of which you start making changes you know you almost start to think about prepping in a way where you're like i gotta make significant oh, yeah. changes in my life because I I can't be in this situation, you know, where I don't have certain things in order to protect my family. And I don't read it and think, and, and, and I read it, read it all those years ago now, 
Yeah. And I'm like, I can't tell you that that's not how shit would go down. No. Yeah, there's... I, there's I I'm not, reading, an any, I'm not reading anything here that makes me think he's being pessimistic. No. Overly pessimistic. No. No. I'm reading it going, that's fairly accurate. Yeah, in terms of a, in terms of a worldview, it, I think it makes you... His, his stuff in some way makes you feel like being that being defensive is a that, that being defensive about um what you have and what you value is a it's it's a defendable position to feel defensive mm-hmm. or to feel yeah. like you're maybe um yeah to to be aggressively defensive about what around what's around you that you love right. a lot yeah it's almost creating your own sanctuary right so it's like it's okay Mm-hmm. You create your own sanctuary. Because look. <laughs> yeah, because look at this. What What do you think about previous, though? So if you're to put put a list of things, authors together. That were impactful to me? Yeah. That's, yeah, a, fun, yeah. that's a much more fun list. Yeah. The authors that... It, it's a little bit complicated because you inherit them. I, I went through a thing that... I th- I'm guessing it's changed a lot. In 2000, I finished uh, what's what, what, an MFA, a Master of Fine Arts in mm-hmm. Nonfiction. Um, I'm sure that whole world has eva- has gone through dramatic changes. Uh, they were MFA programs were at the height of their power. I went to a very good MFA program. It might you might not think that it was. It was University of Montana, mm-hmm. but University of Montana had this stellar writing program. Very hard to get into. Um, I later met people that were responsible for me getting in and I was kind of a what they, they viewed me as a wild card, like a roll of the dice mm-hmm. um, to let me into the program. Really? Yeah, well, which is a lot of like, like a lot of Ivy league kids. Oh, right. Gotcha. A lot of people who had phenomenal scores. I had a writing, I had a writing sample. I didn't do, I didn't take the GRE seriously. I, I did mediocre in college. Um, not bad, but not great. Right. But I, had a writing sample that was that was just something that they hadn't seen mm-hmm. meaning i was writing out of a world i was writing out of a world that that they hadn't come across mm-hmm. and so i got in i wasn't a whore i mean I, I had i wasn't like a crazy crazy wild card i mean i'd gone to college i right. had like i had whatever a three four or three five like pretty good great you know i didn't bomb the gre but i didn't do great in the gre but i got in on that i got in on on my writing sample and got in and and it was like people at that point in time um you know i met other kids that were also going through these same kind of programs and we all read these same things like everybody read a writer named raymond carver everybody was in love with this mm-hmm. with raymond carver people read joan didion mm-hmm. um People had a very uh, a respect, if not a love, for the writer John McPhee. Yeah. When Jesus' Son came out by Dennis Johnson, everybody was very excited about mm-hmm. Dennis Johnson's Jesus' Son. When a heartbreaking work of Staggering Genius came out by Dave Edgars, um, it, it became like almost like a Bible for mm-hmm. writer kids, like uh, us people that were all trying to become writers. What happened was so many of them, um, wanted to be avant-garde mm. because these are all avant-garde yeah, writers. Yeah, yeah. And so everyone wanted to be, they wanted to be the person that would write the next Jesus son. Yeah. Or they wanted to be the next Ray Carver. And they all wanted to be that they were dysfunctional, that you could be like drunk and write like great. Harrison yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like, you like, you could, you know, be drunk and bombastic yeah, and, yeah. and brilliant. And that was the way to go. Yeah. And so we read just out of that immature, that little bit of immaturity kind of read these uh, Hunter Thompson would be not. So Hunter, he'd already kind of, he was already, he already passed his precedent. He set his prime, but for the kids for, I keep saying kids, we were in our twenties. Those of us, whatever, um, felt like kids that were these, you know, elite, somewhat like elite writer talents that were in these intensive writing training programs, um, you kind of, yeah, the the avant-garde, um, insane, dysfunctional drinkers who could kind of get away with anything. They're still very beloved, 
right? Mm-hmm. We read all those people. Yeah. And, 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 and I don't know. It was almost like you were just were supposed to read all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I never tried to do that. I tried to do something very different. And when I got, when I started meeting, when I started discovering work that sat outside of that, like the, the rebellious writing, um, and I got into writers that were just, that were very disciplined writers. Um, the, the work of this, of a writer named Ian Frazier, he doesn't write much anymore, but, but he was at, at a time a very just phenomenal writer. And he wrote this book called great plains. He wrote a history of the great plains. Um, it was a very celebrated book. Mm-hmm. Had a huge impact on me, but a, a very quiet, restrained personality, um, and 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 just like a, a like a diligent craftsman, mm-hmm. you know. And so when I started getting into that, that became the stuff I really emulated. But I went into it thinking that you know, well, yeah, well, it'd be great to be a like who doesn't want to be Hunter Thompson? Sure, drive around on motorcycles, shooting guns, doing acid. Everybody makes Sounds movies funny. out of your books. Yeah. So they shoot your ashes off in a mm-hmm. cannon. You hang out with Johnny Depp. Sounds cool. Sign me up. Yeah, it sounds cool. <laughs> and then later, like, yeah. there's a couple of people that could pull that off. But later, you become just a like a person who's six days a week, ten hours a day, right? Trying to write a book. And the last thing you're gonna do is you're not gonna do it with a buzz. No, you got to get up in the morning. <laughs> you know? It's insane. Like, I don't know how so they did it. Yeah. So it's all these. But you know, I had never read anything serious. Well, I, I did. I, I take that back. I read it constantly. I would check out the same book. I would check out the, the same books about trapping when I was a little <laughs> kid. And they'd put a, they wouldn't let you check them out for a while. I'd check it out and recheck it out. And then it'd be that you can't check it out for two weeks. Right. To, so, so someone else can cool have a chance off. to check it out. Yeah. And you, you know no one's going to read it. So you'd wait two <laughs> weeks and I'd go get it back. And I'll just read these books. When I got into graduate school, this is so embarrassing. When I got into graduate school, the summer between when I, fin- I finished college, it took me an extra t- semester to finish college. Between when I finished college and started grad school, I was like, I'm, I have to read a book. I have to read like a famous book. Yeah. I tried to read um, the the only small thing James Joyce ever wrote. Which one? I tried to read Dubliners, okay. his book of short stories. Yeah, Couldn't yeah. get through it. But I was like, yeah. I thought to myself, man, since I'm going to this big time graduate program, yeah. I better read something by James Joyce. I sure as shit not going to read Ulysses. Yeah, well, I had it on my shelf. Did you? Did you finish it? Uh, no, I started the first three pages <laughs> and I put it back on the shelf. Or like, yeah. was it Finnegan's Wake? Yeah. And, uh, couldn't, couldn't do it. I couldn't no. get through Dubliners. So I went no. in feeling ill prepared. <laughs> I've always held that. I was like, God, I can't finish this. I'm I'm an idiot. Something's wrong, <laughs> something, with, me. Something's wrong with me. Something's what wrong with me. What do I have? Like, do I have a mental problem? Like, what? Well, I can't I can't do this. Yeah. yeah no, then I got there and realized that none of the wannabe writers, um, none of the wannabe writers actually read James Joyce, but that's how little I knew. No, I I mean but then you would go on to did you did you ever read Cadillac Desert? Oh yeah. Yeah. That or, stuff that's when I talk about the discipline stuff. Yeah, like Cadillac yeah, Desert. Cadillac was, Desert. Like life-changing in sure. some ways right where you know growing up in northern idaho not thinking about the desert not mm-hmm. thinking about kind of the the developmental aspects of how we were kind of expanding at west and then uh allocating water however that is yeah uh, oh it's uh, funny uh, this, you bring it up because i was just talking about that book because uh my colleague clay is reading the rising tide okay and i was pointing out to him i was um pointing out to him how uh, i said you know that and shit like Cadillac Desert, you know yeah, these yeah. really big, just so like perfectly done nonfiction titles that that kind of explain America through some event, you know. Yeah, it's 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 a it's an amazing book. And mm-hmm. It still sits on my shelf today. Like there are things that I'm like, oh whatever, I just throw them away. Yeah, like yeah, it was funny. I hadn't heard of McVie until I did a podcast with uh, Mike Rowe probably six months ago, and he's a huge. Is he big? Oh my gosh! Yeah, he was raving about him, and so uh, my first employee I ever hired, like maybe a week later, all of his books showed up in paperback. Mm -hmm. So he bought me like a big box, every book that he wrote. The other guy that um, that I really like that I read now that I haven't, I I never read. All his books were in my house growing up because my grandpa and my dad read wrote all or read all his books. Was uh, Louis L'Amour? Oh. Yeah. They're awesome. Like the Saget series is awesome. <laughs> like I, as a 45 year old male, I'm like, this is awesome. I love this book. Them? Yes. They're great. They're, mm. 
They're easy. I don't think I've ever read a Louis L'Amour book. Dude, you got to Like the Saget series. So Louis L'Amour is such an interesting guy. Like he is a fascinating person. And he's probably, I would say, and this is my own humble opinion, he's probably one of the most underrated American authors in history because of the genre in which he wrote in. But he did this. You're saying Louis L'Amour is underrated. Yes. Because he's not one, he's not like, to your point, he's not avant-garde, right? He's oh. not. He's not gonna. He, he's Louis Lamar. No, he's like a, he's a male romance novelist. But it's yeah. it's not or even. He's romance. regarded that. Yeah. I should say, he's regarded as such. And you've never you've never read one. No. Okay. So I but I used to have I've had meetings. My I published with Random House Penguin yeah. Random House, yeah, yeah. and they have a Louis Lamar room, and I've been to meetings in the Louis Lamar room. Yeah. And so he did this series called the Saget series, and it's it's not romance. Not it's, Bob Saget. No. It's on this family that he follows from uh, Britain to their their eventual one person as he expands into the United States or immigrates in the United States because he's escaping um, tyranny, essentially. And then he immigrates in the 1600s to the United States. And then he starts a family. And that family branches off. And he does 200 years of this this. Got this it. family story as they're in and, and they're fun they're not like you're not going to sit down and and you know take a notepad out but they're really fun and he did a lot of research so he was making them historically accurate as to who was doing what and where in a lot of the places that were like the expansion west is fascinating and then to tell that in fiction through not just cowboys and indians that's not the way it was he talks about you know, trapping and how yep. when they the first Amer the first British uh, immigrants when they landed in the United States, it was just the land of opportunity. What I thought was super fascinating that I I I um, reading these it just kind of activated. Oh yeah, kind of a, a light bulb moment was why hunting and fishing is so intrinsically American mm-hmm. and why there's it's the developmental aspects of our society is to if you were part of you know Ireland or Britain or whatever whatever European country you immigrated from, what you hunted or fished would belong to the king. It wasn't yours; it was theirs. Yeah. But when you came here, it was the land of opportunity, and ultimately, you know, you were going out and trapping or fishing or hunting, and that was yours, right? So it was yours to yield and take. But there's a definitive shift in the way that people perceived America as Americans and then where they were coming from as far as even tyrannical control. Sure. Which I thought was, why is hunting so intrinsically American? Well, they didn't know how to hunt. That was the other thing. Yeah. They were soldiers. They had taken long, that collection of those Western Europeans had taken a long break from hunting. A long break. Yeah, <laughs> 9, they had. thousand year break. From and they had, they had to be taught how to hunt. <laughs> yeah by their native american friends for a lack of a, a better term but they had to be taught how to do these necessary skills in order to survive and how important and necessary that was even as we started to expand you know west yeah, later yeah yeah but i thought how one i hadn't had that thought experiment That's, before that that you know when i was talking about wild new world yeah the book i just read that was uh-huh. depressing to me um great but depressing to me is it it talks largely about how that sense of liberty and freedom kind of got away from them. Oh yeah. <laughs> it took yeah. a little far. I could see that. <laughs> Cause like I thought about it just in the context of, okay, you're going into this place and there are no rules. Mm-hmm. So you can do whatever you want. Well, without discipline and order, yeah. it becomes controlled chaos yeah. because that's kind of what we like to do as, as, you know, well, we, I'm not lumping everybody into this, but that's just kind of man's nature. It's like, you know, with, without some type of order or structure, you're going to have a significant impact on your environment because you just, yeah. you, you cause a lot of havoc. It, like it you, becomes you become, a, well, if I don't, he's gonna. Yeah. And then I got to do and, it. Until it becomes that he can't. Right. No one's going to slow down. <laughs> Nobody's going to slow down. <laughs> no. no. It's like, it's either me or him, bro. Yeah. And like, you see that. Like I saw that in war, like I saw how in 2003, when we did the invasion, when you're doing an invasion, there are no rules. It's 
wild. It's 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 not the wild west. It's wild. It's the most chaotic event that you could imagine in, in any thought process. Mm-hmm. Because you think about it in the context, at least even before, I would think about it in the context of movies or you know things that I've read. You, what doesn't capture it in the only movie that truly captures the chaos of war is apocalypse now Mm -hmm. that's the only thing that that truly captures how fucking insane it is and so you're participating in this ultra chaotic event and there are no rules and you have godlike power it's it's a wild experiment and i thought about that in the context of the western expansion because you have in some certain circumstances, even just having horses, right? Before the introduction of the horse into the Northern America, like, you know, horses and gunpowder, like that's godlike ad- advantage. Yeah. Yeah. So you're out in the, you, you know, obviously as you, you, you go out, but you're in this uncontrolled environment, which is ultimately yours. And the only thing that will kill you is essentially the environment itself. And there are rules in it, but, it's a wild experience, I think, to think about Western expansion and then being involved in something, I would say, on a micro level, how similar and yet addictive. Because I can't imagine what it would be like to have the entire West of the United States. And if you're built like I am, look, the sense of adventure and what like if you're eight, you know 16 17 years old and you're yeah. living like I can't imagine having that 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 black or I shouldn't say black but that that non-existent map sure and having the opportunity to be like, okay I'm going to step out and I don't know what's going to happen I don't know where I'm going to go I'm just going west yeah in an environment where you could literally get away with murder yeah literally like there's yeah. no recourse no yeah and there's no cell phones or it's you know, toxic or what you, yeah i, I could I imagine mean, toxicating in a negative way but just an enormous yeah it's that's what i dedicated to, to with reading i when i was young i dedicated myself to reading about the people that experienced that yeah it probably was in a lot of ways very informed by it but that set of i just didn't do it from the writer louis the more i just throw that out as a suggestion i'm, I'm not trying to, to hack on the brother no, you should. No. I think everybody should because should hack on Louis Lemoore. No, I think everybody should take a take a take a turn on it. They should take it because it's one of those. Uh, it's a paper black. It's a paperback novel that you can carry in your back pocket and you can throw it away if you don't like it. At the end of the day, it's it's like he's a he's a. I think he's an important piece of American literary history. I'm really going to read the Sagets. You should up till the Bob Saget yeah. episode. Like I carried. Um, I mean, I carried a book every almost everywhere I went in war, a paperback. I can't even imagine like how many books I ultimately threw away. Mm-hmm. But I carried them all the time because it's like it gets boring. Sometimes war, you're just fucking bored. War, war gets boring. Yeah, it does. Like it's not like you're in a gunfight all day long, twenty four hours a day. There are days where you're like, I gotta sit on this pallet of MREs for a week. Okay, I gotta have something. So take out a pen and you've convinced you convinced me. I'm gonna read it. You should try it. Anyway, um, so we covered this. I, I, you want to do some trivia? Is that right? Is that what no, we we're going to No, you're going to stick around for oh, our I'm going to stick sh- around. You're going to be in our trivia I'm show. I'm going to be in the trivia show. Uh, you didn't know this? No. I, Jamie told me probably, but honestly, we're gonna they, finish. Just, they just spring this shit on our me. People, and I'm like, our people are going to come in, Okay. and you're going to participate in our trivia show. Great. You're going to be a guest of honor in the trivia show. He'll throw, <laughs> a you'll, guest he, of he'll honor. Throw, you'll get thrown a bone. A guest of honor. It's 10 questions. All right. I love it. Let's go. Let's transition. It's 10 over. questions. Usually a winner will get six or seven. Great. There's been one perfect game in the history of the show. Okay. Well, let's try it. Let's go. Let's go.